Good morning. We have general questions. Question one, Stuart McMillan. To ask how many properties in Inverclyde would be affected by the proposed reforms to the top four council tax plans. Cabinet Secretary Alex Neil. Presiding officer, over, of over 37,000 chargeable dwellings in Inverclyde, as at September 2015, only 6,900 are in the top four council tax bands E to H. 3,400 of these are in band E. The proposed reforms would result in a maximum increase of £110 per year or £9 per month or £2 per week. 200 band E to H households in Inverclyde, Clyde, as at March 2015, are in receipt of council tax reduction. These households would be unaffected by the multiplier changes. In addition, band E to H households below net median income, up to a limit of £25,000 per year, would be able to apply via the CTR scheme to protect them from the multiplier changes. Mr. McMillan. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that reply. And can the Cabinet Secretary confirm that these proposals will result in a net financial income for Inverclyde Council, whilst protecting those living in the properties at the lower uh, four bands? Cabinet Secretary. Presiding Officer, this investment will be targeted according to the number of eligible, eligible children, not where the money was raised. It will deliver additional education provision over and above what would otherwise have been available. Further details will be confirmed following discussions with local government on how best to implement this programme, but it will apply to children in primary school and S1 to S3. The funding will primarily be calculated based on the number of children eligible for free school meals. The funding will go direct to head teachers. 75% of Scottish households that live in bands A to D will be unaffected by the reforms to the council tax band system. And as I said in my initial answer, a further 54,000 households living in bands E to H and low incomes, more than one third of which are pensioner households, will be entitled to an exemption from the changes through the council tax reduction scheme. Question number two, Bob Doris. To ask the Scottish Government how it is helping to support delivery of the living wage to care workers in Glasgow. Cabinet Secretary Shona Robinson. As part of the 2016-17 budget, we have taken action to protect and grow our social care services and deliver our shared priorities by investing a further £250 million in health and social care partnerships. Part of this investment is to enable local authorities to pay a living wage to care workers, supporting uh, vulnerable adults, including in the independent and third sector. We have allocated £33.28 million uh, to Glasgow. Of this uh, significant enhancement in resource, we would expect the local authority to utilise resources from their allocation to enable them to commission adult social care services on the basis that a living wage is being paid. Bob Doris. Uh, I thank the, cabinet, thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Uh, given the fact that the care sector is a female-dominated sector, does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that this is also a gender equality issue in paying the living wage to care staff, and it will also raise the status of this very important sector? Can I finally ask how the Scottish Government will make sure that this commitment funded by the Scottish Government will be delivered by Glasgow City Council? Cabinet Secretary. Um, can I uh, agree with uh, Bob Doris? Um, the Scottish Government is committed to making uh, Scotland a fairer place for all, and I believe the allocation of this further investment in social care will enable local authorities to ensure our care workers, which, as Bob Doris said, many of whom are, the vast majority of whom are women, receive the living wage. Um, in the, the city of Glasgow, we estimate that there are about 6,000 care workers who will benefit. Many of those are women, and across Scotland, around 40,000 uh, care workers. In terms of the work to take this forward, clearly we are working very closely with COSLA, um, uh, local government leaders and indeed third sector and independent sector organisations to ensure that the detail of the delivery of this is in place uh, for the, the 1st of October when uh, we are, this is due to be implemented. Question number three, Margaret McCullough. <laughs> To ask the Scottish Government what impact fracking would have on Central Scotland. Minister Fergus Ewing. Officer, no fracking is permitted in Scotland as we have a moratorium on unconventional oil and gas developments. The Scottish Government will take no risks with Scotland's environment whilst unanswered questions remain about the potential impacts of unconventional oil and gas. 
One of the world's most comprehensive programs of research into this technology is now underway. And we will also hold an extensive public consultation to let the people of Scotland have their say. This is the only approach which clearly and consistently promises to engage with the evidence and the public on this issue. Margaret McCullough. Even with this moratorium in place, there are people across central Scotland who are concerned about the impact of fracking and want to know that their leaders will fight against it. Yet Jim Radcliffe of Ineos has reportedly received assurances that the SNP government is not actually against fracking at all. He says the government are being quite clear. What they've said to us is they're not against fracking. For clarity, has anyone acting on behalf of the Scottish Government ever given such an assurance? Minister. Absolutely not, Presiding Officer. The position is, as I stated this week, last week, the week before, and it remains the same. The, the approach we've taken, unlike the approach of the Conservatives who have now arrived in the Chamber or the <laughs> Labour Party, uh, we take a sensible approach where, uh, where we look for the evidence. And let me just run through some of the areas where I think uh, it is absolutely correct that we are looking at the evidence, understanding and mitigating community level impacts from transportation, including in central Scotland, decommissioning site restoration and aftercare, understanding and monitoring induced seismic activity, climate change impacts, economic impacts and scenario development. All of these and more areas, presiding officer, are essential that we provide the evidence to stakeholders and the public. What could conceivably be wrong with that approach? Yeah. Question number four, Mike McKenzie. To ask the Scottish Government what progress is being made with the duelling of the A9. Cabinet Secretary, Keith Brown. Uh, construction of the A9 duelling began between King Craig to Dalradi in September 2015. Uh, the first section is expected to be completed by the summer of next year. The remaining duelling is on course to meet the Scottish Government's target of being completed by 2025. The design of remaining projects is progressing well, with one quarter of the preferred routes announced last week and the rest anticipated during 2016 and into early, uh, early 2017. Exhibitions are currently taking place where the route options are being displayed to the public for comment. Mike McKenzie. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Does he agree with me that as well as creating and retaining jobs during the construction phases, the duelling of the A9 will provide a long-term stimulus to the economy of the Highlands and Islands, as well as improving safety for motorists? Minister. Uh, Mike McKenzie is absolutely right. This will have benefits in terms of its construction for employment and longer term benefits in terms of increased productivity and more efficient transport system. The A9 plays a vital role in supporting the economy of Scotland and not just the Highlands and Islands, with an estimated £19 billion worth of goods transported annually. The journey time and reliability benefits associated with the dueling programme will reduce transport costs to business. It will also improve connectivity be between the Highlands and the Central Belt and provide opportunities for the key business sectors, including tourism. The upgrading of the road itself will also reduce driver stress and frustration and lead to improved safety for the 12 million vehicles per year that travel between Perth and Inverness. I am very pleased it's the Scottish Government that has made the first commitment to dual this road and the A96, which for the first time will mean that all Scotland cities are connected by at least dual carriageway or motorway. Question number five, Claire Adamson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what it is doing to support the steel industry. Minister, fair uh, I chair the multi-agency Scottish Steel Task Force, which was convened immediately after Tata Steel's announcement that it planned to mothball its Scottish steel plants. The task force brings together the company, trades unions, local authorities, government agencies and local elected representatives. This task force is doing everything within the power of the Scottish Government and partners to support the continuation of Scotland's steel industry and a viable future for the steel plants at DL and Clyde Bridge. We have, presiding officer, made significant progress in five key areas. Business rates, energy costs, support for staff, environmental matters and procurement, all aimed at supporting our ambition to see an alternative operator for these sites. Claire Adamson. 
The Minister will be aware that I attended a European Commission conference on fuel intensive industries and heard the concerns of the industry across Europe in the economic climate of steel dumping and high fuel costs. Does the Minister share my concern that the UK Government and Commission are taking too long to address the concerns of the industry and it's about time that they took the positive action and support that has been demonstrated by the Scottish Government? Minister. Well, I, I share the concerns of the member that there is a need for urgent action by both the UK Government and the EU, uh, and we continue to press the UK Government. And Claire Adamson uh, has pressed all of these issues at the meetings of the task force, every one of which she has attended. John Pentland. The uh, Minister appreciated, though it is, uh, key, the key question is not what the Scottish Government has done, uh, say, but where it is going. It is now over five months since Tata made their announcement, and for the workers, all that has happened is a phased decline with mothballing and support to help them get other jobs. This was not supposed to be the objective. So when will the Scottish Government look at Plan B to fulfil its guarantee of a future for Scottish Steel by whatever means necessary? Minister. Well, Mr. Mr. Pentland sits also on the, the task force. It's an, a, a non-political body, presiding officer and we have all been working together. Uh, and I'm not sure that I would accept the characterization of the position that he said. For example, uh, several of the key workers necessary to restart the plant uh, are currently undertaking a skills course. Now, their skills are being preserved, presiding officer, precisely because there are not many people that know how to operate a steel plate mill. And if we had not instituted this pioneering scheme where the key skills required to operate a plate mill, if we had not done that, it would simply not be practical to reopen the plant. Uh, and that has been done at the Scottish uh, Government's uh, behest and at the public taxpayer's expense. And secondly, our objective remains absolutely resolute. That is to find an alternative operator to take over to resume steel operations in Scotland. And as the First Minister undertook, we have left no stone unturned. That is uh, what we continue to do, uh, uh, and uh, I, I'm sure that I will engage further next uh, Wednesday with Mr. Pentland at the last meeting of the task force prior to Perda. Question number six, Richard Lyle. Thank you, President Officer, to ask the Scottish Government what it has done to protect the provision of speech and language therapy services. Cabinet Secretary, Shona Robertson. The provision of speech and language therapy services is managed by NHS boards and it's for individual boards to decide how best to deliver these services to meet the needs of the population. We've appointed an allied health professional national lead for children and young people who's working with NHS boards across Scotland to support the creation of a network of speech and language therapy leads uh, to enable a, a joined up approach to service design and delivery. And we've recently published Ready to Act, the first children and young people's services plan in Scotland to focus on the support provided by AHPs, including speech and language therapists. Richard Lyle. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for her reply? The Scottish Government research has shown that people with unmet communication support needs are more likely to have negative interactions with the law. The Royal College of Speech and, Ther and Language Therapy has suggested that a speech and language therapy pilot programme could be launched in Scotland's criminal justice system. Although, although the government has no formal uh, commitments, are there any plans to make this programme a reality? Cabinet Secretary. I, Richard Lyle uh, raises um, some important issues. I mean, Ready to Act recognises that communication difficulties can impact on vulnerable young people at risk of entering the criminal justice system and particularly highlights the importance of early intervention and prevention in seeking to identify and address behavioural issues caused by communication difficulties before they escalate. We are going to be working uh, collaboratively with the Royal College of Speech and Language Therapy as well as education and social care uh, colleagues on the implementation of Ready to Act and will consider with them how best to address this issue. Question 7, James Dornan. I ask the Scottish Government, in light of the reported 12% increase in small business jobs in five years, what it is doing to ensure that this growth continues. Minister Fergus Ewing. Uh, officer, the Scottish Government provides a supportive business environment, offering a range of assistance, including the Small Business Bonus Scheme. 
This alone reduces or removes business rate for almost 100,000 premises and delivers an estimated £174 million of savings in 2015-2016. Uh, ministers of the Scottish Government, presiding officer, have committed to continue the scheme for the whole duration of the next Parliament, if re-elected. Jim Stoneman. I thank the Minister for that answer. In the last three years, 77 small and medium enterprises across my CART constituency have increased their workforce. Can the Minister give me a, maybe a wee bit more detail, tell me what role he considers the aforementioned small business bonus scheme has had in achieving these results, not only in Cathcart, but also across Glasgow? Minister. Well, yes, I, I can. And uh, I think that the small business bonus, whereby businesses, uh, small businesses, uh, and I used to be one, presiding officer, pay no or low business rates, makes an enormous contribution to the economy and the growth of small businesses in Scotland. And to, to uh, answer Mr Dorner's question, official statistics show that over 9,000 business properties in Glasgow benefit from this scheme. That's why, if re-elected, we will keep it for the whole five years of the Parliament. And I do hope that other opposition parties will join in with that pledge so that it becomes beyond politics, but is something that's guaranteed for every small business in Scotland. That would be truly a great thing. Question number eight, Mary Fee. To ask the Scottish Government when it last met NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde and what issues were discussed. Cabinet Secretary Sean Rob. Ministers and government officials regularly meet with representatives of all health boards, including NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde, to discuss matters of importance to local people. Mary Fee. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer? The Cabinet Secretary will be aware of the leaked report by health board officials showing proposals for major service changes at the RAH in Paisley. One local mum, Karen Meekel, has described how important the RAH children, Children's Ward is to her son, who has a severe form of cerebral palsy. She has said, every second counts when it comes to getting him treatment. Will the Cabinet Secretary give a cast-iron commitment to worried parents like Karen that if her government is re-elected, the RAH Children's Ward will be protected from closure or any downgrading whatsoever? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I can say to Mary, Mary Fee that we recognise that the paediatric service provided from Ward 15 at the RAH is a highly valued local service. Um, but as the NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde Chair John Brown has confirmed, none of the contents of the, the paper which Mary Fee referred to have been approved by the Board or referred to the Scottish Government for consideration. Obviously, any proposals for major service change, as Mary Fee uh, knows, would be subject to formal public consultation and ultimately require our approval, and we have received no such request. Question number nine, Neil Bibby. To ask the Scottish Government when the Cabinet Secretary for Health, Wellbeing and Sport last discussed the future of the children's uh, ward at the Royal Alexandra Hospital with NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde. Cabinet Secretary, Shona Robertson. Well, we have not uh, discussed the future of the children's ward at the Royal Alexandra Hospital because, as the chair of NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde made clear in a statement on the 15th of January, there are no formal proposals to change the services delivered from the ward. Neil Bibby. It's a very interesting answer. You have not discussed this important issue with the health board. Thousands of people in Paisley, Paisley like Karen Meikle, have made it clear, have made it clear they do not want to see any closure or downgrading of the RAH children's ward. I am also clear that Scotland's largest town should have its own children's ward protected and not be subject to any closure or downgrading. The question that still remains unanswered is does the Health Secretary agree with me and local families, yes or no? Perhaps um, Neil Bibby should have listened to the answer that I gave to Mary Fee, that we recognise that the paediatric service provided from Ward 15 at the RAH is a highly valued local service. As I said to Mary Fee, the chair of Greater Glasgow and John Brown has said none of the contents of that paper have been approved by the board or referred to the Scottish Government for consideration. So therefore, of course, if they haven't been referred to me for consideration, then we won't have considered them because we've had no such request. Hopefully that's simple enough for Neil Bibby to understand. <laughs> Before we move to the next item of business, members will wish to join me in